managed to get my if circuit working so basically Frank and synth going on in the background but when I play an A flat but more of that later over to Sandy Hi Christian, today I'm going through a quite arduous process of figuring out what all of the different parts in my component order are. A piece of advice if you're going to be ordering from a bill of materials or multiple modules or for a very complicated module where it's going to have lots of different components, I'd recommend putting your own reference on the order for what each component is. Mouser will allow you to do this. For instance, if you are ordering a 710-88501-200-6051, you can make a note that that should actually be capacitor six for the links module. I've been going through my bill of materials and searching the part numbers from the order and then making a note of what this component actually is. Uh, for the literal hundreds of components that I've ordered for this build. So that's going to take a little bit of time. So whilst I was doing that, it got me thinking about uh, some of the different things you've been talking about, generative music and, and sort of indeterminacy. And it sounded like you're, you're approaching the idea of doing if then logic. I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the different modules and some of the different ideas that you might need or use uh, that might help you along with that process. So first off, you'll, if you search logic modules on Modular Grid, there are literally hundreds of them. The most common being the sort of Boolean logic. So that is AND, OR, NOT, and NAND, which is NOT AND. Uh, there is also XOR, which is exclusive OR. So I'll talk about what those all are. I'm going to be talking generally that they're receiving gates, high gates, or you know ones and zeros essentially. But if you read the specification for the particular module you're using, it will actually tell you what, what voltages it will consider a one and a zero. So logic modules always deal in ones and zeros. It's sort of yeses and nos. So an AND module, for instance, has two inputs and one output. And the output will be a one, if the inputs are one and one. So if the first input is high and the second input is high, then the output will be high. Uh, otherwise, the output will be zero. For OR, it's if input one is high or input two is high, or indeed if both are high, then the output will be high. For NOT, you have one input and one output, and they will always be the opposite of one another. So if the input is one, then the output will be zero. If the input is zero, then the output will be one. For AND and OR, you also have NOT versions of those, which are NOR and NAND. So it will be a case of you basically will get a zero whenever an AND gate would have been putting out a one, and you'll get a one out whenever an AND gate would be giving you a zero. So for instance, if input one is high and input two is high, then the output will be low. But if you've got a well, one and a zero going in, then you'll get a one going out. Or if you've got two zeros going in, you'll get a one going out. It's quite confusing. So ands and ors and nots. Uh, the other one is exclusive or, which means that it will only be high if both, if one or the other um, are high, but not both. Uh, so it doesn't behave like an and gate. You don't see a lot of use for exclusive or when you're doing sort of logic with your CV, but a lot of these will also do audio rate. So they'll compare two audio signals or a sine wave and an audio signal and give you some really gnarly distortion. So you'll see XOR quite a lot in digital distortion modules uh, that can get really pretty crazy sounding pretty quickly. So your logic uh, is basically used for comparing ones and zeros and spitting out ones and zeros that you can use to trigger other events. So you might want to have something that is like, if I'm playing a note on my piano and there is a note being struck on the sequence, then do this thing, you know, if x and y then z. So how do you get those ones and zeros to put in? There are some useful modules there as well. Uh, the, the ones that are uh, that immediately spring to mind are comparators and envelope followers. So a comparator, basically you'll set a voltage level and when that condition is met, then the state will change from zero to one. And then when it's no longer met, it'll change back to zero. I've done some quick sketches to demonstrate uh, what this might look like. So if you were feeding a sine wave in, uh, and this is your threshold here, then the output 
will basically be a square wave which corresponds to the points at which the sine wave crosses the threshold. That's a comparator and that's really useful for turning one CV signal into a different CV signal, usually a gate or a square wave or something like that. However, uh, you couldn't use that to detect a transient on a piano for instance because audio voltages are constantly crossing zero. So I've done another little doodle to demonstrate what that looks like. Say for instance we have two hi-hats here, very simplified version of two hi-hats, and you can see that they're going up and down and up and down and up and down, and up and, and so on and so forth. And you set the threshold here, then it actually crosses the threshold several times and you end up with like a sort of a square wave vised version of the sound. You know, that can be really cool if you feed a drum beat into a comparator that's meant for CV and end up with like a squelchy square wave version of that drum beat. But that's not really what we're looking at here. What you'd want if you're wanting to sort of give a gate for the peaks on your audio signal is an envelope follower. Uh, there's loads of those as well, and some of them have all sorts of wacky and weird features, but essentially, basically you set a threshold volume level or, or amplitude level, and when the audio crosses that, it will spit out a gate, and it will keep that gate open until the audio drops below that level again. Uh, this can be really useful for, for doing sort of logic with your incoming audio. So if you take that output from your envelope follower and maybe a comparator, you can feed those two together and get gates when those two conditions are met or when one or the other is met or so on and so forth. So you, I hope that gives you some ideas uh, to try out with your various modules. Again, I haven't even talked about some of the things you could do with the modules you have. So your maths, again, I'm always coming back to maths. That module can spit out a gate when it gets to the end of a cycle. So I hope that gives you some, uh, some inspiration to go and dig around and do some, some logic puzzling around. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Back to you. Thanks ever so much, as always, Sandy. I think we're all very appreciative of your contributions here. Um, you guys got really snotty about my patch cables last week. Was I doing something wrong? Is it because the lengths are all kind of massively spaghetti-ish and I'm being untidy? I'm afraid I'm one of those, as you probably can tell from my vlog, I'm a bit of a stream of consciousness type of person. So for me, it's all about flow. And I'm not going to sit there kind of going, oh, this isn't the right length. Must go and to the other side of the room and get something like this. And let me know if there's a protocol that I'm not following and I'd be very interested. But for those of you who are not kind of in, in quite yet on board with the modular mindset, I have to say one of the greatest pleasures of creating a patch is this. getting rid of it. It's not just the pleasure of pulling out all of those cables and suddenly you've got a clean rack in front of you. It's the ephemeral nature of modular synthesis. I know from that moment that I pull them all out, it actually feels like you're shearing a sheep that's really kind of satisfying. From that moment, I will never get that patch back. In fact, when I switched that patch off the other week, I switched my rig off now over the night because, you know, after seeing that 4MS clock divider go up literally in smoke, I do have a fire hazard fear, particularly seeing as I've put this thing together myself. Anyway, when I switched the rack back on, it actually sounded kind of entirely different. So that is the beauty, the ephemeral nature of modular synthesis. And I know for a lot of you media composers, you know, it's all about the ability to recall. Well, I was speaking to my friend Oliver Arnolds about this because he does everything in the analog domain, you know, analog setups, uh, uh, you know, spring reverbs, and everything he does is recorded into Pro Tools. And I said to him, surely when you get a recut, that's a nightmare. And he said to me, yes, it is, but it's not a reason not to do it, which I think is a very good moral to live by. Anyway, let me take you through my if circuit. So let's switch that off first, like that. Ooh. It's nice when it stops. So it's a very basic circuit today, but uh, with one kind of addition of something that we've kind of looked at but not really explored, which is the spectral multiband resonator by 4MS. Now, basically what I've got is I've got the Metropolis playing a little sequence direct into our oscillator. So let's have a listen to that. Joyous. Uh, like a 90s car alarm. What I've actually done is I've got that going into a voltage control filter. 
So that's just basically filtered down. And then I've got it coming out of that into this VCF. Basically, I'm just using this as a mixer today. And there's basically another in there. And we've just got it coming straight out of the mix out. And then that's going into the Echophon, which is uh, synchronized to the click out of the Metropolis. This is basically a delay. And then we've got uh, some uh, reverb from the Herbverb. Now, if we just have a quick listen to that now, that takes us back to where we were. However, I've also got a few things being controlled by this multiplier. I've got the feedback of the uh, verb, so a little feedback loop here, and uh, that is basically controlling the amount. So we've got a CV coming from this multiplier into that, and we've also a triggering this Atlantis, which is just playing one note. This again is going out into this being mixed and is going through this effects unit. So this is just a single note, that root note that you heard before. And then finally, I've also got the CV in of the voltage control filter being controlled by this multiplier. But what is being multiplied? Well, it's a CV out from this multiband resonator. So if we have a listen here to what that sounds like, out, I've basically got a single band, this one here, which is essentially being notched. Okay, so that's the, basically the kind of the signal that runs through the circuit until it is broken here. And what I've got it broken by is the Wurlitzer in. I've got it multiplied on my patch base, so it's just raw Wurlitzer coming in. So if I go and hit that A flat, it kind of causes it to overload, but what you can also get it to do is use that to create a control voltage, and that is what is being multiplied here, and creating basically slightly more chaotic events, but specifically when I hit the A flat. So if we rig that all up again, we don't need to hear that horrible noise again. So there's the metropolis just kind of whirring around, but filtered down. Let's just take that out for now. And then if I hit the A flat, you can make it become quite chaotic by really kind of encouraging it to keep, you know, feeding back on itself. And also, obviously, the, uh, if we just take that out, we can just put the resonance up. Conversely, if I take this out and put that in, we're not hearing this oscillator now, just hearing uh, this unit here. And again, if I hit the A flat, gives us a C sharp. So all my Wurlitz is doing is going into my Axe Effects with my favorite patch, which is 138 Black Hole. It's made by Fractal, and what I like about this unit is not many people have it, because I just use it for presets, and then we've got the dry signal coming into the multiband resonator. And that is my IF circuit. I don't know if you recall, a few weeks ago I mentioned that we've got this kind of semi-autonomous thing here. It can be random, it can be chaotic, the chaos can be controlled, hands-on and you can jam to it but, but I wanted it to get to jam with me a little bit and I'm starting to prepare a patch for next week which I think will blow your minds because it's gonna take advantage of these chaotic random features these fixed features these uh, autonomous choices but also react and respond to my playing along with it and change its behavior accordingly very exciting stuff